Oh, you have a little mixer thing too? Look, at you. you're professional now. Doug, you've come a long way. Thanks, Joanne. I've learned a lot from uh, you guys for sure. I like to almost, credit us. Almost every, <laughs> <laughs> almost everything, dude. Literally. I, I like to give us credit for that. No, I'm kidding. I think you should take credit. I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, literally everything. Like Javier in, in particular, like I started off with a different, um, I was running the mics through the laptop. Oh, and yeah. if in the first episode, it was giving me like so many problems. So literally, that's like the easiest thing ever. Like you literally just put an SD card. You you run your mics through that thing. There's an SD card in that thing? Mm-hmm. Oh, just any sweet. other SD card. And it literally has like 48 hours of like. So audio is um, on that, but then your video is up yeah, there. Yeah, and then I just sync it. Come a long way, Doug. You have come a long way. Um, I've been in the industry a while and I don't even know that shit. <laughs> have you, have <laughs> you heard, I stand on the shoulders of giants? Have you heard that term? I've heard it. Do you know what that means? Are we the giants? Yeah. Shut your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'll get Javi can be the giant. <laughs> he's been, he has though. He's been your mentor. Oh, I for think. Sure. Like, yeah. Most yeah. Definitely. What are you drinking? Topo Chico today. Just Topo Chico? Yeah. Any uh, alcohol in there? You know, I'm experimenting. Oh. Um, so I'm trying to see like the difference between my sober podcast and then my, my, my inebriated podcast. So you're choosing to test this on me. Yeah. Thanks. But I, I think. So you're making me drink alone is what you're saying. Um, I'm kidding. I, uh, <laughs> I could grab I a ha- drink. I had to drink. Yeah. Yeah. But I think uh, I noticed with the sober podcast, um, I think I'm more sharp. But mm. on the, one of the ones I'm drinking, I'm a little bit more like um, at ease, if that makes sense. So yeah, no. it's kind of give and take, you know. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like I share more. But well, let's we see how are, much I share. <laughs> We are on episode 10 of The Most Vulnerable Player, um, and today we have a very special guest, a guest uh, that's, honestly, it took a little bit of work for me to uh, make this one happen, a little bit of convincing, um, but I'm glad uh, I was able to, uh, to to get through, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to cancel earlier today too, but how are you really? Oh, kidding. you scum! No. <laughs> no, today has been a day. So honestly, like, I'm glad I'm here, like sitting right here. But like leading up to it, I was like, damn, the last thing I want to do is yeah. not not specifically like sit here with you. Oh just no, for sure, I get Sit you. and do any kind of like pull myself away from what I was doing. That's yeah. that's the thing. But yes, so I'm, what I'm is excited. it that you're doing? Well, a lot of things. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. But the um, I'm gonna plug my uh, yeah. Let's plug that current uh, project, which is Neep Collective, which you're familiar with. But and by the way, this is gonna be dope for like reels and stuff. So, right. <laughs> so do Javi, good. Javi was like, um, "No, you can't cancel. You have to go plug Neep." <laughs> I was like, "Yes, that is true. Yeah. Use use your platform, which you have. You've like built a." A solid platform here so i'm really proud of you doug like thanks we're gonna interview you now <laughs> so no i'm kidding um yeah so we're in the process of opening up a patio bar and food truck park and like i have been an entrepreneur mm-hmm. for a while like the last what like been self-employed for the last like what uh, four or five years, four years since I was in China and had an actual employer. And then after that, uh, yeah, like the last four years. Um, but this is the first time like I am responsible for an actual establishment and paying payroll to employees and like having the responsibility of building out an entire business. Yeah. Type from, deal. The, so from, from, sc- I mean, it's from also, the ground up. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Literally like broke around, November of last year and from the ground up we have been building Neep Collective and we're in the crunch free crunch phase because we're trying to do a soft opening like next week and grand opening in two weeks so so yeah to say that my head's been kind of everywhere today and I kind of didn't want to do this but I'm glad that I'm here with yeah. you today maybe we can uh help ground you ground you a little and just bring you back to uh just a, a more grounded level, you know, okay, so you can reminisce. Do, what do you do? What do you do? Um, 
but actually before I, I don't think we're done plugging neep um what what do you think is gonna make a uh, neep kind of special because i mean there's other patio bars and stuff so what do you think is gonna make neep stand out especially here in el paso um so we're not gonna lie like we built when i say we i reference we as me and javi um because and who's javi Sorry. javi is your brother aka my husband so i am uh, we're, we're 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 in-laws here mm-hmm. so um i reference we whenever we talk and i'm trying really hard to like talk about myself Mm -hmm. because it's something that I don't do enough of and I want to be more aware and do it more often so when I do reference we I'm referencing the fact that me and Javi have like built I mean we've been together the last 12 years married for six we actually forgot our anniversary because we were so freaking busy with Neep that we realized like (laughs) towards the end of the day that oh shit today's our anniversary but anyways, like um, when I reference we, it's me and Javi. Um, we have been working on this for, for like so long. And you see, look, so bear with me. I have ADD. So <laughs> if I just forget where I'm talking about, that's what just happened. That's okay. I was like, where was I coming from this story? Yeah. What makes me uh, special? <laughs> there we go. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, good, dude. Um, and I took my medication this morning, but still. Anyways, um... What's going to make it special? Like we built Neep because it's something that we would love to do and have access to on the daily in El Paso. So um, we have traveled for the last, God, six years, seven years. Um, So we've experienced a lot of like different places and really learned what we love And realize that there's a lot of people like us that have similar interests and enjoy the things that we enjoy. And like for us to be able to build something that we would be super excited and passionate about experiencing daily is something that we realize like, hey, let's do this. Because if you would have asked me five years ago, what would I be doing? Opening a patio bar would not be one of the things that I would say. So, um, yeah, building this place for people like us that you can like gather outside. We're like trying to change the way people gather here in El Paso. We've seen it in places like Dallas and Austin and like El Paso has always been a bit behind in terms of like what's trendy, what's new, what's um, like up and coming. So we're like, you know what, if we can bring something that's like first to market, there's the business side of me thinking like first to market, um, something that can potentially hit with millennials, Gen Z, like a wide range of the market. Um, Yeah, we were just like, like, this is something that I would love to do. So the fact that we're behind it, we're really trying to like invest in the people that are also going to be a part of it Mm -hmm. and like picking and working with really amazing people that value the things that we value so like we're trying to pull from places that we loved to bring something different not that there's not great places here in el paso but there i don't think there's anything like what we're trying to bring to el paso Mm -hmm. um so yeah so the fact that we get to have full control of it and if we are not able (laughs) to not that we failed but if we are not able to build exactly and execute on exactly our what our vision is um then maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and kind of rethink the direction we're going in but like if we're able to execute this and meet the goals and the expectations that we're setting for ourselves like this place is going to really like take off and be a really incredible place to gather with friends and family. So we are creating a place that we would love to be and bring our family and friends to. And we just want to invite all of El Paso and the community to experience in something like that. And by the way, that's, I think it's officially announced today that yeah. August 25th, Yep. August 25th is going to be the grand opening yeah. of Neat Collective. So um, whoever's watching this, just know that uh, we're going to see you there. And um, go follow at Neep Collective at Neep Collective on Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> and if we didn't uh, emphasize enough, there's going to be delicious food trucks and beer and cocktails yeah. and all that sort. So 
yes definitely come by and you're the one and only is going to be behind the bar so um i think you guys should come visit that's all i'm saying if you if you uh vibe with him is that what your generation says if you vibe, you say that too (laughs) i don't know i just make fun of you all the time um as if like there's this huge difference in generations or whatever but i'm only like 10 years nine nine years older than you how old are you uh 23 32 32 nine so um like we have a very not complicated relationship but like we clash a lot (laughs) so (laughs) um i was kind of hesitant about like where some of these conversations could go and like just not truly hesitant i think i i i don't know from my perspective, I totally understand where Joanne's coming from. Let me explain a little bit better. Better, I think. I hate Doug. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I refused to be here, but yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> we hate each other. No, I'm just kidding. No, actually. Oh, so I, you're saying it's is reciprocated? No, yes, one hundred percent. Anyways, I think what it is is that you may not. Who, who knows? We'll see. You may not agree, but I think we're similar in a lot of aspects. I could say, yeah. I and would agree. Maybe not um, with certain values. Definitely not because I think we get in a lot of arguments. However, when it comes <laughs> to personality and like, I think that may be the reason why is because let's just be honest. Like Javier and Steph, I think are a little bit more passive than me. I could see that. Yeah. And so you're not a very passive person, and so I think that's where like the thing is it's not like we don't get along it's like it's just we know that it's like it's just a funny dynamic we clash a we lot clash, yeah we're both very stubborn too yes. you're very stubborn oh for sure you're yeah. so set in your ways <laughs> i think that's also why like i do have a personality that like if i see not specifically a flaw but like a area where i feel like i also have like this big sister like i guess view to our relationship too where if you don't meet an expectation not that you don't but in terms of like i don't know of anything or it's like you're too set in your way but it can be from my perspective done differently and you're not willing to give i require a lot of give from the people around me because i have a very strong personality i have a very um, I think that comes from the fact that I did grow up with six siblings. So we were always very competitive, like fighting for attention, had to be very strong willed in my household, um, very direct with what we wanted. So like I like to control situations and you don't give me that. So I think that's <laughs> why um not that other not the hobbies always like giving into me which poor guy sometimes i feel like (laughs) (laughs) pobre (laughs) javi but you don't do that and i think that's why we clash a lot is because you're very like strongly opinionated and and we have differences of opinion so if you don't agree with me i'm like no that's (laughs) not that it's wrong because i am willing to listen to other perspectives but yeah we do get into it sometimes i've heard that i i think i agree i think I've heard from multiple people that I like to be right all the time. And so true. I, uh, I, I'm, it's something I'm aware of. I'm actually trying to get better at, but, um, I feel like I, I could maybe, I think what, you know, what mom getting hurt has kind of helped me like a little bit, try to be a little bit more, you know, unselfish in some ways, and you know, give that. Yeah, yeah. Like be more aware of, of like, having to put aside what you want yeah exactly and making time for yeah, other i agree that's something yeah. i definitely uh, i think i have trouble with is um just i don't think i think it's all about me but when it's when it comes to like wanting to when it comes to my goals and like what i want to do and like my plans like I feel like I do have a hard time um, putting those to the side. Mm. So, but I have to understand like other people. Sometimes sometimes you have to, you have to sacrifice. Yeah. 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 Um, You're very driven. You're very focused. So when you have to put what you're like focused on aside, it like, it's something that you have to actively consciously tell yourself that you need to be working on. For sure. I think so. And, um, but I applaud you for being like aware of it. 
Yeah, no. I think it's my definitely my toxic trait for sure. But um, toxic, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, something you're working on. Yeah, exactly. But as far as I mean, we can go down a rabbit hole. But sorry, I, I know I'm just like I don't like you, and I didn't want to be here. But, but I th- no, that's as sorry. far as perspectives, I th- I think I'm fairly open minded on when it comes to like certain things like ideas mm. i think when it comes to ideas but when it comes to like other things but anyways <laughs> um what we are first what got us into this i think i uh i actually thought this conversation would go very well i don't yeah. know how yeah for sure um and so let me get us started actually so <laughs> my 10th guest on this episode is joanne luna and um she is a entrepreneur she is a uh, YouTuber. I mean, basically, what marketing specialist you can say, uh, and now bar owner, right? So I know you grew up in San Eli. San Eli. Yeah, we're we're it's, its own little city. Yeah, it's not a- even part of El Paso technically. It's El Paso County, but growing up, I lived in a little bubble outside in San Eli. Um, rarely made it into El Paso. Like literally, it was like San Eli, and then you have to come into El Paso. Yeah. So, yeah, I grew up in San Eli, San Eli High School, um, but because it was such a small town and I wanted to expose myself to more, I immediately after graduating high school moved um, into the dorms at UTEP. Did you feel like... I never uh, looked back. Did you feel like growing up in a small, like, because you had El Paso, but you grew up like a little bit outside, but growing up in a smaller town, like, were you aware of things that you might be missing out on like did were you aware of that or wasn't until you actually like ventured off where you're like dang there's so much more. i mean like growing up i always like i knew there was always more and that was one thing that i always was like i am going to move out of sun alley and i'm going to i don't know travel just do the, all the things that i never got to do when i was younger growing up mm-hmm. but we did we lived in like a bubble um the only times we ever left sanity was to come into the city for like doctor's appointments or like walmart with grocery shopping i mean i'm one of six my mom was a stay-at-home mom she still is a stay-at-home mom i still have a sister that's at home um but like literally we never really left sanity it was just like to go to the store but then again you're a stay-at-home mom lugging six kids around with you there's not and like we didn't grow up with a lot of means so i mean if it was just going to the store that's basically all we did outside of sanity we weren't like we didn't go to the movies i mean it's a large family um my dad worked but still we didn't do much right Mm -hmm. so if we weren't leaving San Eli for the purpose of going to the store or like doctors off doctors visits. We lived in San Eli and like I knew there was more, but I just like, I mean, accepted it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I had the opportunity to leave and try to experience more for myself, because I was finally in control of my situation, um, graduating from high school and you finally like, Um, I was on a scholarship for college, so I moved into the dorms. So I had, I mean, loans and all that, but I like to think that finally I could stand on my own two feet. So yeah, as soon as I left San Eli, moved out and never really looked back. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my parents still live there. I still go visit, but could I ever imagine myself like moving back to that area? Definitely Mm -hmm. not. It's just... It's so secluded. There's not a Walmart. Like, the closest Walmart's, like, Socorro. And, I mean, like, personally, I, it's just not, it's just not, I'm not one to live in, like, a small town. Yeah. I always dreamed even of, like, I'm going to go live in New York. Like, I even applied to, actually, I never even finished the application process, but I always imagined, I'm going to just make it, it's just going to happen. I'm going to live in New York one day. But, Mm -hmm. Um, never got there. I lived in Shenzhen, though, and that has, like, millions of people. So, I mean, I definitely say I need to be somewhere there's at least a target within mm-hmm. like <laughs> a 10 mile radius or yeah. something you know so. so when you when you got to utep um what were your what was your outlook on your life at that point like w- did you know what you were majoring in or what what did you see yourself doing at that point oh gosh if we take it back oh so i mean 
I was very like sheltered in my bubble in San Eli. So the moment that I was able to move out and go to college, I actually partied way too hard, mm -hmm. lost my scholarship my first year. Um, so your major wasn't even like at the forefront. You're like, what were you even like? I was like, I'm going to do something that I liked. And at that point, it was like accounting, mm. which now I'm just like, no, like never mm -hmm. could I just like do like I just know like after the first year I stayed with accounting and then after like the first year and failing a couple classes and realizing that I'm not going to be okay with like working behind a computer at a desk and I think that's kind of where I realized that okay maybe accounting and the desk and the office is not kind of what I want um but yeah I switched majors a couple times. I went from accounting to at one point, I no, I think I always stayed in the business. Mm -hmm. I think I just went from accounting to marketing to just general management, yeah. but I always stayed in like the business, the business school. Yeah. And you joined a sorority, right? Oh yeah. I joined a sorority. Um, my, again, so first year of college party a little too hard with some of my like high school friends in the dorms and then I joined a sorority which I continued partying mm -hmm. but the great thing about a sorority is that um, they do actually keep tabs on your grades mm. so in order to stay in the sorority you can't exactly fail out of school and you mm. can't just party you do actually have to do well in school and of course also I was actively trying to bring up my GPA and I was always really good at school in high school but I went from this place of like um, all of a sudden I have all this freedom. So now I just took way too much advantage of the fact that I could do whatever the hell I wanted. And sometimes that meant not going to classes. So, so yeah, um, joined a sorority and I did that for a few years, took a little longer to graduate than the typical four years. I mean, you graduated in three, so who's counting, you know, yeah, me, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> So I took a little longer to graduate, um, but yeah, graduated from UTEP. And as soon as I had the opportunity to, cause I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I moved to China. That's what I did right after college. Yes. I kind of jumped probably a little yeah. too fast. <laughs> let's, let's slow down a little bit. So yeah, so you go, you're going through college and you basically you, you bypass this uh, stage in, in your in your life where you're basically just going crazy partying and everything you end up doing this and you work at aeropostale right oh yeah so I, you you worked at aeropostale and you, you you thought you were going to continue that as like like a corporate job no so like my idea was like my dad worked as a basically like a handyman mm -hmm. and that's what i knew him as and he still does um my mom was a stay-at-home mom so i was like you know what to get me out of like poverty basically um i need to cr climb a corporate ladder and um the only corporate i really knew was like retail and then you could work your way up in corporate mm -hmm. so um yeah first job was aeropostel that's how you that's how oh, you actually say aeropostel. it aeropostel oh. yes aeropostel um did did well there like i I was good at merchandising. Um, like I took on like leadership roles. I worked my way up in management, ended up making it up to like associate store manager. And I thought I could possibly work my way up through like regional manager or shift into the more corporate side of retail and do like marketing or somehow work my way up retail corporate ladder and i was like yeah that's what i'm gonna do but i could only do that for so long so i think part of me is just like itching to do new things and like at that point i was pretty tired of retail at the same time because it's also very demanding and very you get like shitty hours and um your schedule's all over the place and i was making decent money but uh definitely not something that i wanted to do i guess long term after yeah. once i neared the end yeah yeah i realized nope not not something i want to do yeah and so so yeah you get through air postal and then you said you hit a point where you're you're kind of a little like over that in, yeah. a, in a way and then take me through that moment if if you remember it like i'm, I'm sure you can remember to like 
the exact moment where this idea of like China really just came into the picture like how how did that happen because I mean going just up and moving to China especially if you're from like El Paso Texas it's just like from Sun Alley like, yeah it's just like hold up like let's back up a little bit so how how did that uh come into fruition I don't even know to be honest like I just knew I was I felt like I coming out of high school I was like okay I know I need to do something in either the corporate field or I just need to figure out a way to do well mm -hmm. like do well and I thought for a while it was going to be retail and then I was like frustrated because I kind of got to a point where I kind of hated it and I was like so this is not the answer D sorry do well for what like was it because you were financially because so fina you were you just grew up not really having you were when you guys weren't stable yeah so it was that you were made, mainly motivated financially yeah yeah so I I think a lot of my decisions have been financially motivated mm -hmm. definitely so that's usually a pattern that with people who are don't really come from yeah. much money you know so I'm working at Arrow and I'm just like okay about to graduate and I can either go for like the um, store manager position and continue down that road or I randomly ran into, not randomly because it was my cousin. My cousin is the one that told me about a friend of his that I knew but like we're not close but he was telling me about a program that he did and he was telling me, oh yeah, he just got back from China and I was like, that's super random but tell me more. Um, and literally, I don't even know what time of the year it was, but I was nearing like my graduation date, like nearing college graduation and just random conversation. He tells me about a program that you get to teach English in China. And I was like, uh, tell me more. Not really thinking that it was even a viable option, but somewhere along the conversation, he literally was like, yeah, let me call him and get you more information. And like right then and there calls, calls Freddie and he's like asking him to share some information, shares the information with me. And then literally from like that day to the next day, I was like, I was with Javi at this point. So I'm like, I think I'm going to do it. And I'm just like, I'm like, I think I'm going to just go move to China. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the next phase of my life like mm -hmm. I think that's the next step and made the decision like from one day to the next graduated started filling out paperwork over the summer and then that next school year when you're on that plane like first thing going out there like what's what's going through your head shitting bricks For real? <laughs> dude um like leading up to it I was like super excited and just so ready and I was like it's I mean sad that I was but mind you, I had never traveled on an airplane before. I don't think ever. I'm getting on the plane and I'm saying bye to Javi and I just like break down. And I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. Like, what am I doing thinking I'm going to move to China by myself and just live over there for 10 months? Like, I, like, I guess I had like a little breakdown on the plane and I'm just like, oh, what the fuck am I getting myself into? And then it doesn't even get better than that. Like getting into China, like my plane lands at like 1 a.m. and I have no Chinese like UN on me. I only have my, I think I had like a couple hundred in cash, my debit card, and I know none of the language and it was like the worst experience. I just remember getting to my hotel that night and calling my mom <laughs> and crying. And I'm like, what am I doing? Cause it was like the worst experience. Cause like I show up at the airport none of the terminals are like, nothing's open. I don't speak the language. There's, I, there's no way for me to exchange money. So then I have to pull out money from an ATM, but my card is blocked because I didn't tell my bank that I was going to be doing an international trip. So I have to get like this translate on my phone to get this taxi driver to take me to an ATM down the street, but then it still won't take my ATM. So he takes a hundred dollars from me. And yes. in reality, the taxi ride for him to get me there was like supposed to be like 15 bucks, but he took a hundred dollars and I'm like, 
like falling apart and then finally i'm like terrified that is he even gonna take me to my hotel get to my hotel check in and then that's when i call my mom and i was just like broke down and i'm like what the fuck am i doing why am why did i decide to do this um thankfully like the next day the program the people that were leading the program picked me up and i go to orientation and i make friends and it ends up being like a much better experience but that first Leading up to it was great. The actual day of was terrible. The next day was terrible. And then it got better from there. Yeah. But who the hell thinks to let me go move to China? I don't know. Me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's insane. And just from the perspective of like hopping on that plane, like just because I remember, I don't think I, I, I didn't break down, but it was definitely like, I remember being like, unusually emotional like at the airport like i was just like holy shit like it was really a, when it when it finally hits you it's like yo what the what what the fuck am i doing like dude? you feel proud of yourself because you're like doing this like crazy thing and or you think you should be proud of yourself but then it doesn't go the way you think it's gonna go yeah. or it just like somewhere along the yeah. the road it just like flips completely yeah. and you're just like either either it's like yeah i'm super excited or you're just like completely like what the fuck am i doing and why mm -hmm. am i doing this and doubting every single thing decision that you've made up to that point and it's just like um now i have to just deal with the decision that i've made and i'm here and try to make the most of it yeah yeah and so being in china and people don't understand like you have to put emphasis on alone like being in a foreign country alone yeah like, i think that's a huge thing so what were first of all actually i want to start with the good what, what was the good some of like the um best things about being in a foreign country and just experiencing life abroad you know what was what was that like like the fact that you're in complete control or to an extent, control of the decisions that you're making. I think for me, that was very empowering. Like I chose, like granted, doubting every decision that I made, but the fact that I took every step myself. So I think that's, that's extremely empowering. Um, I made, I got to experience like cultures and stuff that I never did like before, like even especially I just wanted to have like this extreme dynamic to what I grew up with and being in control of like my life at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. And having the ability to move to the other side of the world and having the, the opportunity to make new friends. And like, I made, I made so many friends, like so many friends from freaking Ireland, Wales. I had so many friends from Wales. <laughs> like really? Wales. Oh, wow. And I'd never heard of Wales before. Yeah. And um, I bet you maybe, did you meet any Americans out there? Uh, actually, because the program where they placed us at the school, there was also like my program and then an American program. Oh, so yeah, okay. I did. Yeah, yeah. So I did. Um, uh, some of my friends like Daquan, I still like occasionally check in on him and like, um, he's from New York. So yeah, I did make some really good friends. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I got to make new friends, got to travel a little bit. I mean, didn't know half of what was going on in terms of like communicating or any of that, but like I got to experience a lot. And I think that's what I genuinely wanted out of the experience is to like get to try new things and yeah. do things that I never really would have thought were yeah. possible, I guess. I, would you say people, at least from, at least from my perspective, like I don't think people understand how different it is. Like it's literally like an entirely different way of life. Like, it's your entire. It's it's like you might as well be on another planet. If it yeah, was like, yeah, for sure. Because there's like even just the dynamics of like the way people move or walk or like the way people congregate or just the normal customs that mm -hmm. you're not used to when like you go to another country and then. Like, you're in China, and it's just, like, yo, this is surreal almost, so. Like, the first the first um, city that I was in was one of the small cities in China. I think there was only, like, 4.1 million people, and that was small. Mm -hmm. But, like, for me, coming from living in a small little bubble in San Eli to, like, all of a sudden being on a subway with 
thousands and thousands of people getting from point A to point B and learning to navigate that and figure it out on your own. It's just like and people are people stare at you, right? As oh, like for a sure. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So like Do people touch you. Or is no, that, no, never. No, I don't think I ever like felt like uncomfortable in terms of like physical touch yeah. or anything like that. Um, I'm sure like my black friends or super blonde friends would definitely probably get touched at least like hair, hair or yeah. yeah but me like i had dark hair so i kind mm-hmm. of like it was kind of natural for them because yeah. everyone has now black hair you, you could be asian now i, I could, think about it i could be asian mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> but except my skin's a little too olive yeah. um but like i didn't stick out as much as other people probably did yeah but definitely still stared still talked about behind i mean not even do your face pretty much it's like so the one phrase that I did learn was make Warren and that's like American. Mm. So in Chinese, I'll make Warren this, make Warren that. So it's like, she's American. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I knew they were talking about me, but yeah, like for the most part, always felt safe too. Um, even as a woman alone, I did have lots of friends, but you're always aware of like the fact that you're a woman by yourself. Mm-hmm. And I always felt safe. Like I always, I never, I think... Like, me and Javi talked about it after coming back to the States. We were, like, in San Francisco one time, and we're like, damn, I feel even less safe here in yeah. San Francisco than I did in freaking China by myself, you know? Um, so, yeah, like, I just... My first year was so great. Like, was so great. I made so many friends. And then the fact that Javi was able to visit me... I mean, granted, we're doing, like, a long-distance relationship... And at one point, he does come and visit me like midway through the year. So it's like, okay, five months. Is that months? when he proposed? Yes. Yeah. So five months, um, five months on my own technically, but I made a lot of friends and I was able to like, um, I mean, keep myself occupied and get to experience new things. So my first five months were really nice. And then Javi comes and visits me. And then we get engaged and decide that, you know what, we're going to do this another year and come back together the next year. So it was like the first couple of years living in China were really, really great. And it was like you're getting to travel, experience all these new things. Like um, after doing it alone now uh, to have Javi come out there, we're doing it together. And like we have an apartment. Sorry, I probably jumped. No, it's all good. I'm I'm (laughs) curious about that. Um, also though, I, cause I think it's a really good question I have to ask cause from Javi's perspective, he did say there was like a moment where when he wanted to, or when he was deciding to go out there, it's like, you didn't want him to do it because it was just cause to come with you. Like yeah. it's something that, could you explain like that whole like dynamic? So, cause I mean, I think that's super important because we're our own individuals, right? Yeah. And like yes you can like have a really good relationship with someone but it's also your life so i'm pretty sure like that was something i think for me it was coming from a place of like i felt very like driven and like this is what i want to do and i i i think i say in in control of my decisions in life a lot because i lacked that like autonomy before i guess so like for me i was like yes, this is what I want to do. I want to like, this is, this is what I want to do. And I, I guess was very selfish and I'm like, I wanted to feel okay being selfish. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this is what I want to do. And for him to say, yeah, I'm going to move here too. I felt like he, you want in a partner, someone that's driven and that's going to challenge you and, at that point, I think I was seeing a lack of drive in him to do what he wanted. Mm-hmm. And I thought he was only doing it because I wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. So I like, we had like a couple of dis- like arguments and like it was a huge conversation for us at one point where it was just like, no, like Javier, I do not need you to come over here because you just want to be with me like i want you to make a decision because this is the next part of your life and you want to do this because you're excited about it and you want to do it and you love the opportunity of it not because 
I just want to be with my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was like, like, no, dude, are you sure? Like, no, like you can't just move across the country to follow me across the world. Yeah, across the world. <laughs> <laughs> to the other side of the world for me. And uh, yeah, so for me, it was just like I didn't see him choosing to do that for himself. And he yeah. was choosing to do it for me. And at the end of the day, I didn't you, want him to do that. You say it's selfish, which it may initially come off, but you also, that's because you care about him also, right? Because you, oh, sure. you want him to, like, that's his life too. So, like, let's just say he moves across the world and, like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I think it's, I don't think it's the most selfish thing, you know? I think it's funny because your dad's always like, like at the beginning of our relationship, he was always like, he really approved of me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like he really, he really liked me because I pushed Javier, you know, like yeah. I pushed Javier to, well, he, to he, do more. He and liked you because you got completely wasted at the first party you ever went to with us. I had met them before though. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but that's, I know, I can't believe I met your no. family like that. But anyways, yeah, so I, I, I agree I'm that. I'm so sorry, uh, that was my first impression. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree that you, I mean, I was kind of little, so. I, don't, I really don't remember, but yeah, I, th- I think my dad th- is is definitely appreciative of that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you want you want to push your partner to be the best version because you th- like I think I deserve the best version of you yeah. to be with me, yeah. type deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's why. Yeah, it was it was a rocky conversation slash slash patch. Um, while we were figuring that out. So was it a leap when you, when, when he decided or was it like, I think like we're good. Like this is going to work. Yeah. It was like, uh, like, okay, we're going to do this. Like, yeah, yeah, this is going to be the best thing for us. Yeah. Describe the, like, what was the hardest thing about being out there when you were out there alone? What'd you say? (sighs) Riley. That's my dog. She's angry. Um, probably just like missing family functions. Mm. Like, I mean, you have your group of friends, so it's nice that you can celebrate like the Christmases and like my first year Thanksgiving. Um, like, like my closest friends were Welsh, like Welsh and English. So like we had this nice little like Thanksgiving And, like, you're able to celebrate those, like... Western holidays. Holidays and moments with your friends. But, like... It's not the same. I'm going to cry. I miss Javi's graduation. You know? Like... (laughs) Ah! I'm not supposed to cry. (laughs) We actually, because of Brett, we brought some tissue up here. Did you really? Do you feel like someone who never... A person who never leaves their country or even their hometown for that matter do you think they miss out on certain aspects of life for sure like i think like if even if it's like a road trip like if you have the opportunity to travel outside of your comfort zone and like just see anything more than what you're used to like it just broadens your perspective on so many things and like makes you so much more appreciative of situations and, and like just yeah like i never realized how much i love el paso and i always used to say i'm going to move away from el paso i like but also my el paso was saneli so i even moving out of saneli i was like even El Paso is too small for me. Yeah. Like I'm never going to live in El Paso. And now like coming back, I'm just like, thank God I am getting to live this part of my life here right now. Mm -hmm. How did Javi and Joe come about? China. You see, if I would not have decided to ask a little bit more for a little bit more information on that random program and move to China, Javi and Joe on the go would have never begun. Yeah. Do you, do you look at stuff that way? Like, do you do you feel like uh, certain things in your life are meant to be, or like you go through certain situations to put you, like, like for example, you crossing paths with like that one friend, or you having that conversation? Like, do you look at it in that way? Like, do you do you yeah. feel like it's all connected in a way? Damn, I kind of hate that question because it's like. I hate just being like what's meant to be 
is meant to be or like everything happens for a reason because I it's like so cliche and I kind of hate it but you have to be able to jump at op- an opportunity when it's presented to you so it's not just about like everything's happening for a reason like maybe some things do but for the most part like you have to be open and willing to like take advantage of a certain situation and how like, do you take how, advantage yeah. is kind of bad to say but like to like think of it as opportunity versus like that it's just gonna happen or like that things will happen a certain way like you have to like actively try to better the situation that you're currently in i don't know i don't know if i'm saying it correctly how do you know it's the right decision oh god that's a that's a good one how do you know because you won't know until you've lived it i think trust that you're gonna make you're gonna make the right decision right then and then if not i guess the way i try to look at it is even if it's not per se the right decision either way you're going to learn something yeah and like your experiences and what you've already lived are going to guide that to kind of like help you decide if it's something that you're willing to take on and can take on and have the capacity or like the will to do something Mm -hmm. that is needed for these next steps or the next phase or whatever I mean, you're never going to know if it's the right decision. Like, you're never going to know until you've lived it. But trusting yourself that you're going to make a decision based on everything that you know that you're capable of. Mm. And that things are going to work out. Yeah. Yeah, And you do have to, like, sometimes just trust it and, like, have faith in yourself and just trust it. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Or sometimes, like, you experience some shit along the way. Um but then it gets you to the next part. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, yeah, it's not always pretty, but you have to be willing to try to trudge through it Mm -hmm. um, and look at it with an optimistic, like take on stuff. Cause if you're, if you think, if you're always thinking that it's going to go bad or that it's the wrong, the like your mindset matters so much. So Mm -hmm. it's just like, if you are hopeful, and approach something with a hopeful, trusting mentality. Um, yeah, that's all you can really do because yeah. there's no way to know if it's a good decision mm-hmm. at all. And a lot of the shit that I've freaking <laughs> cho- chosen, not that not that it's shit, but like sometimes it's just like, okay, I'm going to try to this and okay, I'm going to do this. And then it thankfully has led me to the place that i am now and i think i'm doing okay yeah you're still alive you know <laughs> yeah i'm I'm, do, I'm okay yeah, yeah yeah and so so yeah you're in china and at this point it's your second year and javier is over there with you mm-hmm. right and you you guys are doing a little bit of traveling on your like your holidays and stuff mm-hmm. so what makes you start picking up a camera and recording all this and really just putting an actual like name to it and Mm -hmm. make it an actual thing you know so what what led you to that point like the first video we ever like put together was our our engagement trip that's what we'll call it um the trip my first year that javi came and visited we filmed some of those travels and put a video together over like oh my gosh I can't remember the song, but it was just like a it was Coldplay, I think. Uh, yeah. Adventure of a Lifetime, yes. right? Yeah, I remember that video. <laughs> Adventure of a Lifetime, and it was just like a uh, like cinematic, like just like a highlight reel of what we did, right? So that was the first video we ever did together. I'll speak for Javier. It was shit. <laughs> I mean, he would say the same thing. But <laughs> no, but a lot of the stuff that we did, looking back at it now, we're like, wow, that's so bad. So, so corny. So bad. <laughs> so terrible. We have evolved a lot and our skill set has improved drastically. But no, we originally thought, you know what, let's, or we tell ourselves that. But you know what? We always say, oh, yeah, we wanted to kind of like keep family informed. And uh, to be honest, My first year, I thought of starting a YouTube channel. My first year by myself, I was like, you know what? It would be super interesting for me to kind of just like 
vlog my life because I thought it was interesting. Like I thought I had a lot of like different experiences happening than lots of the people that I was connected to back home. So I was like, mm. oh, maybe I could do, I thought of this, like oh, for sure. my I, first year. I, I can see it. Like I can see it on YouTube. Like, oh, like uh, American, like yeah. is teaching English in China. Like Definitely. you can make so much content out thought of it. Thought of it, but never really took action on it. So that's like something that, you know, like if you think of something, take action. But that's another different story. Um. So yeah, so we were like, we're going to start a YouTube channel just to like, um, keep our family informed on what we're doing and just kind of like share our lives. But we also were following a very successful YouTube couple and we're like, you know what? They have tons of followers. Like, what if we like genuinely tried to build a YouTube channel? Like genuinely tried because we have a different perspective on things. We're two Hispanic people living in China and we don't look like the typical Americans also like that people are used to seeing on YouTube. We thought we could be successful on YouTube to be 100% honest. We were just like, yeah, we're going to build a YouTube channel because we have a different perspective and uh, we're going to make it happen. So yeah, we like kept saying it's just to inform family. But to be honest, we were trying to grow a YouTube channel. And there was a period where, you know, like we were posting consistently and we were getting some traction. We had Just one really good tra- video. Your yeah. Asian travels, yeah. right? your Southeast like Asia Like Southeast Asia, we're like, okay, whenever we go to a different city in China or if we take a trip from, because uh, we're living in Shenzhen. So Shenzhen is right on the border of Hong Kong. So out of Hong Kong, you can fly to all parts of Southeast Asia pretty cheap, um, very quickly. So whenever we take a trip, we would document it. We would try to make them as informational and useful because we made a really shitty Vietnam video one time <laughs> that people just were like, this is the most useless video that I've ever seen. <laughs> and we're like, that was okay. like the, the first video <laughs> the, ever yeah. released. Yeah. Yeah. It was like something about like things to do in Vietnam or like a food tour in Vietnam. And they were just like highlight reels, not structured correctly. And to agree with a lot of the comments, pretty shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people also don't have to be such like such dickheads, assholes, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, and props to you guys for continuing. A lot of people would have been you like, "You know Dude, what? Fuck it's this. so true." Yeah. yeah, like you. That's the part where you have to like get over that hump of negativity and like doubt and like yeah, basically a lot of doubt and you're just like, "Oh, uh, what the fuck are we doing right now?" And yeah, well, you get past that point, but then and then you think you're doing well, and then you hit that point again, and then mm-hmm. you think you're doing well, so. Yeah, we've had a lot of ups and downs and there's been periods where we're super consistent and then there's times when we're very inconsistent and then there's like one video will do super awesome and then we reach like a certain number of followers and then it's like, oh, a lot of shit content apparently for a while. Um, Even though some of our, what we think is like some of our best videos don't get all the views, you know? So it's just like the reality of being a content creator on youtube on any platform you think you're creating really great content it's not hitting the right audience or just not hitting well anyways we did that for in china like two years i think or like a year and a half a year and a half in china we're vlogging and documenting and sharing our travel experiences and javier's i would say javier is more of the technical uh, side of things and then you're definitely like I'm the talent the, you're the talent the, the personality because <laughs> let's be honest when have you first started <laughs> i i i've been with the guy for 12 years and even now sometimes i'm like have you just spit it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he's On got camera. dude he's got in, he's like a he natural has, yeah but he's you come a whole whew. i would say i always say this there's people that for sure like you have to work on it like i think i had to work on it a lot I was just talking to the camera and a lot of people do, but there's some people where it comes natural. And I feel like you definitely from the start, like you were just like, like I've always been the loud one, the way too loud one, all a little obnoxious, (laughs) like, uh, tries to be the center of attention. And for the longest time I was like, kind of like, ugh embarrassed and uh, on try. camera like looking at yourself no or? just in general oh, when okay. people think of me or when they 
describe me, they're like, oh, she's definitely loud, a little obnoxious, doesn't shut up, blah, blah, blah. And for a while, I was kind of like embarrassed of that part of me. But now I'm just like, yeah, that's who I am. And I'm just going to like lean into it. And I was able to land um, like gigs where I am the face of brands and I am like ambassador of this. And it's because of the fact that I am loud and I speak my mind and I yeah, all the traits that used to embarrass me. I'm like, you know what? I am going to be loud and I'm going to talk as much as I want. <laughs> and sometimes I still feel bad cutting off Javi yeah. when we're filming. But you know what? Like, I'm just, that's me. And yeah. I'm just okay with that now. I mean, yeah, you literally said one day, like, did do you think it was a switch where you're just like, because you, you, you just started being yourself. Like, you, yeah. you, you, were, you accepted that, right? And it ended up opening a lot more doors Definitely. than it would have of you just trying to listen to everybody else's opinions and stuff, Definitely. right? So I think that's definitely a lesson to take from that, you know? You got to be loud and bold <laughs> and not <laughs> shut up and uh, not listen to people telling you to shut up, then do it and it's yeah. going to open doors. And for me, it's been really awesome because, oh, what fuck. 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 <laughs> ah! Dude, the, sorry. Just okay, for I'll shut up. I'm sorry. <laughs> the door just like opened like randomly. We're on the second floor yeah. and uh, the door just opened. You do your time in China and then you guys are you guys are in Bali for like a month, right? We got tired of... It was a great experience teaching and living in China, but after a while, we got restless and realized you know what maybe we really can lean into youtube and um try to pursue it more full time so we stopped teaching in english teaching in english we stopped teaching in china and decided to yeah travel around southeast asia for a little while lived in bali for like a month and a half um after that decided you know what we're really gonna lean into our roots and travel through Mexico and try to create as much content as we can about Mexico because a lot of people think Mexico is terrifying and it's dangerous and though it can be and you have to be very uh, aware of your surroundings but that just goes to travel in general Mm -hmm. like you have to be a smart traveler Um, but we wanted to present it in a way that you know what like Mexico is not terrifying Mexico has so much beauty to offer and we were like, you know what? We are going to map our way through Mexico and decided on moving back to this side of the continent and to travel through Mexico for a while after we did Southeast Asia for a little while. But we were going to pursue YouTube full time. Like that was the that was a plan. Like we were going to do YouTube and teach online. So we were teaching online. Um, and that was what was supporting us because God knows we were not making any real money off of YouTube <laughs> or making like a hundred bucks a month or something like ridiculous. We had monetized and we were getting decent views, but you really can't make money off of YouTube until you really have a lot of viewership. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. When you made the leap into like, you started leaning into YouTube, did you feel like a uh, imposter almost? Like almost like, or... Do you feel like people, I mean, I think it's hard, at least for me, like I always felt a little self-conscious about Mm. like just releasing videos and like, did you guys ever feel that? Like, just like, what's going to make people tune in or like, why should we like, just that kind of like imposter syndrome. For sure. A hundred percent. Um, like the word, the phrase imposter syndrome. I listened to a talk recently. Um, and this woman, she is the founder of Honeypot, and mm-hmm. she mentioned that imposter syndrome. She said imposter. She doesn't believe in imposter syndrome, that it's like a construct of your thoughts, or I don't know how she phrased it, but that she doesn't believe in imposter syndrome. And that was the one thing because it was a very like her talk was very like empowering, and it was really really great for female and women. Um, like business owners. So when she said that to me, I was just like, oh, there's something we definitely don't agree on here. Because I think imposter syndrome is so real because since we first started posting on uh, YouTube, um, there was a period where I was posting more on social media. Um, I was really leaning into um, like building a personal brand um and yeah always feel like doubting my 
like validity and like my ability to be a source of information for people. And that's essentially what we were trying to be is like a source and wealth of information for people because we know what we're talking about and we've experienced it and we want to be resourceful and useful and helpful, but also like share our experience and let people know what we're doing and like speak from a place of just trying to connect with other people and all the time like there's always you either hear like a negative comment or like you post something and you watch it back and you're just like what the fuck was I trying to say there or like what was I thinking trying to think that this was going to be of value for anybody because like for us like for me it's always like trying to be like share my myself in a way that's gonna like add value to someone's life so whether it's like providing a resource through travel or um being able to connect with someone over a certain like topic or issue or a problem that they're having so that you're able to relate to that person so like there's always a reason for what we do Mm -hmm. in terms of creating content so the fact that you like you doubt whether someone's gonna absorb it and take it the way that you mean for it to be viewed um and then also getting negative comments and it's just like you're always down to yourself you're you're always down to yourself but there becomes a point where it's just like somehow somewhere you have to start just doing something for yourself because you want to do it for yourself and lean into any positive reaction you get from people so there's always there's there's always been like negative comments but there's always been really positive feedback from people so you really have to lean into that and you really have to just like listen to the very few voices or if you have a lot of voices supporting you you really have to like listen to that and trust that and pay attention to that over like the negative or the Mm -hmm. self-doubt or the like yeah there's like a lot of self-doubt so you just like i'm doing it for me i want to do it because of xyz and as long as you have reason then if it's not enough to just trust yourself lean in and listen to whatever positive reactions you are getting Mm -hmm. so it's like so yeah so i'll always and like i i'm probably getting ahead of myself here but when i got the um, like McCormick gig. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I thought like, who the hell do I think I am thinking that I can be an expert in tacos? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like definitely the doubt. But then it's like, literally there's all these other people that see you as doing so much or like valuing what you're doing. That's, that's, that's what you have to lean yeah. into. And it's like, you can try so hard to convince yourself that your reason is enough, but you always do need like some sort of reassurance. And I don't know how to tell someone that like, no, you're going to get there one day and you're just going to be able to stand on your own by yourself with no support. And like just fully believing in yourself is enough. Mm -hmm. Cause it's, it's hard to say that that's true. For sure. I think, uh, I think especially in what we do, especially when it comes to creating content, like, you literally i think it's impossible to be able to continue if you're not getting any sort of feedback or reinforcement or because if you weren't it's like you don't know where you stand or you don't know like you don't know if what you're doing is actually like helping people or you don't it's just it's not it's it's really hard it's not sustainable especially if it's like something that you're doing for the long run Mm -hmm. if you're not getting at least some people like I mean, it really helps when you get some acknowledgement, like, hey, dude, like, I see you're, like, you're really trying, you know, and I think, uh, I think that really goes along. Like, I was, I was talking about it with uh, Demetrius the other day. It's like, we, we know so many people who, um, like, they're doing things and, like, but, like, they really don't have people around them or have never had people around them that actually just, like, acknowledge them and, like, really uh, let them know that they're actually, like, on the right path and they're doing good, so... I think that's important for for a lot of people. I mean, I think even like for you, like the purpose of this channel and like what got you started was like your 
like your why and your reasoning as to why you did it was like to be a resource and add value to other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So if you're not like your reasoning is like, yeah, in your heart, like, you know why you're doing it. But of course, like if it's not accomplishing what you're intending it to do and you're not getting a response and you're not getting the reactions, it's hard to believe that what you're doing has value and has purpose. So you do need to like, yeah, get that reassurance. And even Mm -hmm. if it's one person, if you change and impact one person through what you're intending to do, like that one person is enough. Mm -hmm. Like it is enough to like, you know what? Like push past that mental block of imposter syndrome or whatever we're going to call it. But yeah, like it exists. It exists for almost anybody. I'm sure every single person has faced it, whether you're like, even in like a profession, like in your profession, like you're always like you could, I mean, I don't know, maybe I just don't have enough like education about a certain like industry or topic or whatever. If I think I have enough knowledge and I think I'm well educated in a certain like marketing area or something like I don't know anyone that, that truly thinks a hundred percent like I know exactly what I'm talking about. I am an expert. I will like, uh, no one's ever going to doubt me. Like there's no way that I'm going to not be trusted in my field. Even like a doctor that is like a very well respected or like a lawyer, you know, like I'm sure even then people still have imposter syndrome, yeah. self doubt. Like anybody I've seen that usually the best people in their field are ones that feel like they don't know enough. You, you can say that for creatives too. People mm. who never think their work is good, good enough. are usually the ones who do like very, like very well. It, it might not be the healthiest thing, but I think it's, I mean, it can be the truth because you're never like, satisfied. you're never satisfied yeah. and, and you're always going to want to be improving mm. somehow. So I think it's a good trait to have, yeah, you know, there we go. Yeah. I like that. Like, mm. it's a good thing to like, you need to face imposter syndrome to push yourself past what you know you're capable of doing. So yeah, that's exactly. a good thing. Yeah. Bring it so on <laughs> imposter syndrome. you <laughs> Dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so you, yeah, you guys end up doing Mexico and then the whole COVID, you know, COVID COVID hit and that asshole. <laughs> yeah. You end up, uh, moving back home to good old El Paso. Right. And, um, we're basically stuck here with each other for well we we literally never until like this past year we were kind of like all here together yeah but um throughout that time dude there were so many of us in this house dude there was like freaking 10 people in this house <laughs> dude like it was like, insane and and the fact that like we would never leave like it was covid so we were like locked down yeah. and there was like we wouldn't go out yeah and it was one, two, three, four, five, six of us. And then Asen. Grown ass people. And it was just, yeah, six. And seven, my grandpa. Four. Yeah. That's seven. No, six with your grandpa. No. Seven. It, it's six, six and then seven, seven with Asen. Seven, eight with Asen. Eight with Asen. And then Shit. Riley, it's fucking nine, dude. <laughs> Riley was later. Literally nine. <laughs> there was a, it was a full house. Yeah. Grown ass adults. Like, so all set in their own ways, stuck in a house together. I think that's where we realized that we clashed. <laughs> and for context, the room you're looking at right now is where I was sleeping. So as soon as everybody moved out, Diego's like, I'm going to claim this as my office, my podcast station. Yep. That's my room. You know what? I'm going to have James. <laughs> James moved into the other room. No, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Here. No. Um, yeah, I'm sure you're glad that we all finally moved out. But it's because that's the thing. Like. We moved back because we didn't realize how long COVID was going to take, like how long shutdown lockdown was going to be. So we never, we didn't have a mindset that, oh, we're going to be back in El Paso full time. We were always like, okay, it's almost over. It's almost over. We're going to leave. We're going to go back to doing what we had planned to do. We're going to go back to Mexico. We're going to continue our like travels and somewhere along the way, we never made it out back (laughs) out that way. Yeah, and for a while, did you feel like you were failing oh, in a way? Sh- not oh, f- not not oh. failing. No, yeah, not failing. Sorry, I didn't mean to put it so harshly, but I can because I can relate. Like 
because you you guys had this plan and then you guys come back and you're here at home like i'm sure you for a while you guys were like 100 percent. geez what are we what are we no, doing yeah here? definitely failure failure is exactly what we felt at yeah. least for me like i felt like that's why i think for me i think javier um like accepted earlier than i did that were we gonna stay in el paso and i think i was just holding on to like no we're not because then we failed and the thing is that we had started building a like an audience and like a following and people that were like accustomed to us posting a certain type of content and like we had laid out our plan for the next like two years which was to go from the borders travel through mexico south central america south america to get to antarctica that was the goal like and there were people that were following us because they wanted to see us accomplish that so even then they were like hey we're just waiting for you to like get back on the road those are the worst right (laughs) so it's like just the constant reminder right there that hey uh you're failing hey dude are you still in thailand like oh fuck (laughs) (laughs) yeah so you get it yeah Yeah. for sure like hey when'd you get back like hey yeah yeah Yeah. so definitely failure for like there was a, a moment of us like definitely like thinking i was like yep we failed but then i guess it transformed into like let's turn our expertise into a new opportunity and we started doing marketing for businesses so um that started growing and we realized you know what maybe it's not failure it's an opportunity to do something different Mm -hmm. yeah and through that you I mean, we can go down the RV route too. But anyways, oh, like I know. That, there that, was that too. Th- we were, we were gonna plan. let's just we were gonna do an RV and travel along all of the North American continent, and then no, <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. It's still sitting in my parents' driveway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's still an investment you guys can like sell or whatever. But we have a plan for it, yeah. so don't worry. We Oof, do have truck. not even like no. I'm not okay, gonna give away gonna... everything when we start doing it. Okay, you'll yeah. Know. So this is i think this is a humongous part in your story um there's a uh, opportunity arises i think it was during covid where you basically see this like what was it like an ad online for like mccormick or like how how did how did this uh thing come along so with the whole opportunity with mccormick yes i'm pretty sure you heard the name mccormick every spice that you have in your cabinet is probably Probably mccormick yeah you've probably had mccormick like seasonings everything so so yeah we had started building a following on our javi and joe channel so it actually was presented to us through a follower on instagram we hadn't even heard of the opportunity like um a follower jessica she's like the reason that things have happened the way that they have yeah um she actually sent us an ad and she happened to follow us on Instagram, had been following some of our more like local El Paso content that we had posted. Um, and she was like, hey, I think that you guys kind of already do this. Um, maybe you might want to look into this and apply for it. Dude, what an amazing person. Dude, like, who, she's who, like- so great. We actually met her at a beer fest in El Paso. And I really hope that she comes to Neve and hangs out. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely going to have to re- like reach out to her personally and make sure she makes it out to Neve. Yeah. But she actually recommended, sent the job posting to us. And yeah, me and Javi were like, okay, the job is for one individual, but we can make this work as a team. Like I already know that I am very confident talking in front of a camera and I have the personality and I can banter and I can interview and I can showcase different products and stuff like that. Um, so we're like, okay, it was requiring a bit of like video editing, but also like the ability to promote and, um, I guess just be an expert in tacos, Mm -hmm. tacos of all things. We had just recently done a, video series about the best tacos in El Paso. So it kind of just worked out perfectly that we had just created all this content about tacos and we were able to reuse some of it. And with my like little talking spiel, um, put together a little video that 
yeah, essentially was submitted as my video application. I did a series of interviews, um, probably the most extensive interview process I've ever been a part of, like multiple panels. And I was just like, wow, this is a very serious, serious position that they're looking to fill here. But essentially, it was literally just someone that could talk about tacos like someone <laughs> that could just be on camera and talk about tacos and i was like wow what are the odds i mean i just i don't know somehow landed the gig um was able to lean into my um uh not ambas yeah ability to ambassador products mm -hmm. and then create good video content about said product um I guess that's kind of what sold me. Um, the fact that I am Hispanic probably paid, played a lot into that. I don't think they, so. Uh, I, I highly doubt it. I really, yeah. Um, no, like they could sure. definitely not have hired a white woman. <laughs> they couldn't have hired a black guy. That's like literally, she had to be a woman <laughs> that has Mexican roots. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It had to be me. Yeah. Like, I think it definitely had to be me. Everything aligned perfectly that I fit the profile. The demographic, you know. The, yeah. And had the capabilities yeah. to do it. So, yeah, I got to be the director of taco relations for a good five months. Travel all over. U.S. No, the U.S. I was going to say North America, but never. <laughs> no, the U.S. Traveled from like like the major cities in, uh, in the U.S. And got to eat some of the best tacos. And during all those travels, like got to see a lot. And that kind of is because me and Javi traveled a lot together. We both like got to see a lot of the things that we love and turn that into Neep. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's and now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Just to emphasize, wasn't like just you went around trying tacos. Like you literally went to the best like taco yeah. places in America and like like did tons of research. Yeah. I mean, so like going back slightly to the whole like imposter syndrome part, I had to fly to Baltimore, which is the headquarters of McCormick, um, and. I just remember like there were going to be series of interviews set up with like the Today Show. And then later I was going to do like an interview with, I did do an interview. Like one of my favorite ones was like with Mario Lopez on. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, what is it? Extra or was it Extra? E.T. Or e. something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, anyways, like I had to do like interviews and there was, there was like a period where I was just like, fuck my life. <laughs> How am I supposed to sit here and be an expert in freaking tacos? Yeah. You literally went through like extensive media training. Yeah. Like, like you were like, training. like you were like an anchor on like good morning America. Yeah, type Like thing. literally with a PR company that was like prepping me for like all the worst case scenarios and all this. And I was just like, insane. what the fuck am I doing <laughs> here? Like how, how did I get here? So questioning everything. But then like after that first week, Every like that first week was kind of like brutal because it's like I went to the headquarters and we had like we sat in the large like conference room and we're like talking and I did an interview with like this historian and then like a bunch of shit happened at headquarters that like I was panicking about and every single day that I was there I think I had like definitely had a breakdown at one point um, in my hotel room and dude. Yeah, like your grandpa passed away while I was over there. Your grandma, I'm sorry. Yeah. During my grandma, really? yeah. Grandma Juliana? Yes. When you were over there, that happened? Yes. So it, so it was in December. Yes. Oh, snap. Yeah, that is right. So did you fly back? No. It was terrible. Yeah. Like so much was going on. Yeah, I think I that was that. the day I had my interview scheduled the next day so like oh yes yeah god that, that's crazy yeah. dude so so much shit happened while i was over there yeah but like definitely had a breakdown because i was like oh, i'm gonna have a breakdown now <laughs> i was like i know okay that's enough pause <laughs> <laughs> the water works uh, no. It's all right. We can get past it. Uh, 
no, that was, no, your grandpa passed away in December. Your grandma passed away. During COVID. Yeah. Yeah, it was my grandpa. No, so, like, my interviews were in September. Yeah. Yeah. Like, when I went over there. Yeah. But, no, like, definitely, I was scheduled, scheduled to have an interview the next day with the Today Show. I was scheduled the next day to have an interview with the Today Show. And then just had, like, a breakdown in my freaking hotel room. And, yeah, like, worst few days in Baltimore came back and then had a couple series of interviews after that. And for those interviews, like everything went so smoothly. It was just like one period of like completely doubting every single thing that I'm doing and then being exposed to it, walking through it. And then I was prepared to deal with the next Mm -hmm. couple of months and weeks of interviews or whatever it was. But yeah, so did that, had a really great time getting to travel, created a ton of videos (laughs) that were never shared. McCormick, (laughs) what the hell? (laughs) I, dude, there's such, it was such great content. Dude, you have such great videos. I think they should still be released, honestly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so maybe like we ended up sharing one um the new york video because when we traveled we created content for mccormick but then we also created content for javi and on the go yeah um so we had created like double content while out there and we put together all the mccormick videos that are sitting in a freaking hard drive somewhere mm. with mccormick and then we started putting together stuff for javi and joe but we couldn't release the Javi and Joe stuff until the McCormick stuff was out. But then that was been two years already. So I'm just (laughs) like, maybe we're going to put it out eventually. But yeah, we got to create a bunch of content, a lot of videos, eat some of the best at some of the best freaking taco joints, like all over the country. And a lot of them were food trucks. Yeah. So that kind of also inspired the fact that like, there's such great food coming out of food trucks all over the nation. So I'd argue maybe some of the best food on. Yeah, definitely. Like, cause there's a lot of like tradition and like the real heart of recipes from certain types of like cuisines being made by people that have lived and eaten that food their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you want good Cuban food, like you go to fucking like Florida and the only Cuban place The only Cuban truck that was here in El Paso that we really wanted moved back to Florida. Just, yeah. So it's like, or like Chicago has such great Mexican food too. Like Chicago. And then like we went to Austin, we went to LA, we like New York, like a lot of really great food in some of these cities. Did did you feel like when you were doing this, were you, did you already have in your mind that you, you wanted to open something up or that came later that came later oh. so like we we were traveling most of like september october september and october is where we did like week after week like maybe like six weeks of just traveling mm-hmm. so i think it was november of 2021 one 2021 huh oh shit yeah almost been two years november 2021 we went to a concert in albuquerque um had really good food at out of a food truck at a brewery in albuquerque marble brewery um i don't remember i think it was like a filipino fusion food truck um, that we ate at and it was like a food truck parked outside of a brewery. So we're like, this is super awesome. We go to the concert on the drive home. We're all hung over. Javi gets to drive as we all sleep. I had an interview scheduled with Telemundo in Spanish. Mind you, my Spanish is not good. My Spanish is very like, I have a good accent, but my grammar is terrible and like, it's shit. So, um, I'm like, we're all sleeping and Javi just gets to drive 
four hours by himself. And he, we had previously that night before, like with John, I remember John was a part of the conversation too. Had been talking about like how cool it would be to do like a brewery in El Paso, but a brewery is like, you got to have some experience to do a full brewery. So we're like, Oh, like a bar would be cool. So literally we had talked about it briefly the night before, but then as Javi's driving us all home, he was able to kind of like develop a lot more of the idea behind Neep. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're actually going to a concert tomorrow in Albuquerque to redo the entire like dr having drinks at the brewery. Are you really? Yeah. What the hell? When did this happen? Sorry, bud. Do you uh, like no. Dirk Bentley? Do you want to go with us? No, it's, it's I can't. But that's when did this happen? <laughs> we planned it like last week. I think. Oh, for real? Is Steph going? I'm sorry. No. 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 Um, just you and Hobbs or what? No. Natalie and John and Anne Marie. Oh no, it's all good. Do you, you want to go with us? You guys have fun. <laughs> um, I, I did think of you like uh, the other day. I was like, damn, we should tell Diego. I'm like, Diego doesn't even like country music. Diego doesn't yeah. even like to hang out with us, anyways. Shut up. When is when have you ever taken a trip with us? We've invited Austin. you to stuff. I've gone with you guys to Austin. Yeah, just because you like Gabe. That's the only reason. <laughs> Gabe's not going to this concert. Yeah, no, but honestly, that sounds fun, but I, I have some, like, so yeah. much to do. No, but we're literally taking this trip because we know we're not going to have any more time after next week that we have the soft mm. opening. Yeah. For We're never going to get a weekend back for at least a good couple of months. And it's like a nice, like, ode to the inspiration of yeah. where Neep came from. So we're going to go back to the brewery hopefully eat at the same food truck if not at least a food truck that's parked outside of marble brewery and then go to the concert and then drive home and put together furniture at neap so and then that's the plan you have no life for the next six at months? least six seven at months least, at least at least we're really going to be try to be as hands-on as possible at neap for at least six months hey if it makes you feel better i won't have much life either so that's very much. true that's um, very true but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be really fun. Like, I think it's going to be a, a place where you want to go to work, or at yeah. least I hope so. I, I'm, I'm excited. We have um, interviews tomorrow morning at oh, yeah. For, are you interviewing? 10 a.m., 11 a.m. How many people are you group, interviewing? Group interviews. So we'll be doing, uh, I think it's four at 10 and three at 11. And oh, out wow. of them, hopefully we'll find at least three that we really love. That's exciting. We had a lot of applications. Yeah. We had a lot of applications. Um, at least like 60. Dang. Had to like work through them and pick out like Did you the look best. up their Instagrams? No, I didn't. You know yeah. what? And then Javi was like, did you look them up? And I'm like, no, because I didn't think of that. I just looked at their resumes and they you, these are the ones that stood out to me. You don't want to discriminate, I guess. Like you, you, it's like love is blind, right? You just want to go off like. A, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's my that's my uh, way of approaching this. Yeah, I want to go off your talent, not if you're a 21 year old fitness model. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So even though we know that's all you want to oh hire. Oh my gosh, I keep my work relations professional. We are so. going to try to keep all our work relationships very professional at yes. Deep Collective, I except agree. for the ownership because <laughs> they were already married before. But Diego is a dog sitter. Yep. Diego, sure Diego is our designated I miss Riley. dog setter. She's a little shit, but I miss her. She <laughs> is precious. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. <laughs> so actually, I want to get your perspective on this. Being a woman, um, are there certain challenges you have encountered um, being a woman, like in business or really just in, in the professional setting, in a professional field, and just whatever you're doing? Yeah, so interesting enough, I, for the last five years, yeah, five years, more or less, four years, have been in business with my husband. Mm -hmm. So um, even then, like, I think Javi's incredible. And I think he has a very, like, modern and progressive mindset when it comes to, like, women in general. Um, and I appreciate that, but even, even then, like working with him sometimes, um, not, not just him, just in general, something that I noticed is like, I do have to be very assertive 
much more assertive than sometimes I would like to be because I have to convince people that I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, Even with him, like, and Javi's great. I'm just using him as an example because we work together and we have been working together for the last God forever. It feels like forever. Mm -hmm. Just when you work with your spouse, you live with your spouse and it's 24 seven. I love him to death. Mm -hmm. I swear. (laughs) Um, But yeah, like, or have to explain my assertiveness and why I have or why I speak a certain way or why I am very, um, forceful in a sense with my ideas and i feel like whereas and we've had this conversation so this isn't going to come to come as a shock for for him to hear but the fact that like i have to i feel like try harder to get my opinions and points across Mm -hmm. on certain certain topics or certain areas that people wouldn't necessarily consider me an expert in but i'm very confident in my idea or what I think I know. And I feel like I have to be much more assertive than I am typically comfortable with. And I've had, have had to be comfortable with it. Um, And just, yeah, like you definitely have to be a lot more forceful with your ideas Mm -hmm. and your way of presenting things. So it's something that I think I have become a lot better with and grown in confidence with, but it's something that irritates me that I have to explain to people. Yeah, you feel like you have to convince people that you know what you're talking about. Yeah, and I'm like, in a sense where it's like, if I was a man, and I know it's like probably redundant and said over and over again, but it's so true. Like, um, even even in like construction right now, like stuff that we've been building or like planning and stuff that I'm pretty confident I know what I'm talking about in. I have to say it a couple times and explain over explain myself so that people understand why my reasoning or perspective or understanding of something is a way that it is. Yeah. Cause it's construction. It's a male dominated field. So I have to make sure that people understand why I think I yeah. know what I'm talking about. Do you feel like um, a lot of women experience that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, like I've been self-employed for the last couple of years. Yeah, like I have been my own employer and we have done freelancing and um, yeah, my income has been dependent on my ability to produce my own work, right? So um I haven't been working closely with a boss or superiors or anything like that. But, um, yeah, if I say was in a specific field, um, I'm sure, I mean, I see it all the time, all over my own socials when Mm -hmm. people have to share certain perspectives or reiterate things a certain way. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's everywhere. And I mean, I haven't been in a corporate setting and this is just me within my own freelance being my own boss and I still experience it. Yeah. So I couldn't even imagine working for someone and then having to encounter this. I mean, it's even more frustrating for me now because I am choosing to be my own boss and I still have to experience it. So yeah, I'm certain yeah like people do do you do you feel like because i definitely can see why i and i can i definitely don't disagree with that i for sure think it's 100 percent the case that especially if definitely more older generation as well i would Mm. i would say that and i'm sure you experience it too but do you ever feel do you ever feel sometimes as a case where maybe you might be expecting that and it's like you you ex- you're already expecting them to like feel like you don't um know what you're talking about so like you already have that preconceived like no shit of yeah like i'm not saying it it's might not, not i'm yeah. not saying it's not valid but do you sometimes have always have to be on guard with that like like i was recently at like a women's conference yeah. and we were talking about like uh like 
not racism. Oh my gosh. We were talking about um, like inequality in the workplace. And I even said it, I was like, to be honest, like, or like racism, we're talking about racism and inequality in the workplace, um, being a woman in like a corporate setting. And everyone was kind of sharing their experiences. And I was kind of like, to be honest, like growing up in El Paso, for the most part, like I personally like haven't experienced certain things. So I would like to think that I don't have this like preconceived notion that like, oh, it's an expectation, but because I don't think it's as, that's my dog, (laughs) Riley. I don't think I have this preconceived notion because I don't think I experience it as often as other women do because like I, again, haven't worked and lived in a corporate field for so long and being in the freelance slash self self employed um like sector i don't experience it so often but i ugh, i could see that maybe yeah sometimes i read a situation and i'm like already defensive already ready to say my piece and be prepared to be defensive over a certain situation yeah. or yeah. Cause I do, I do come off as defensive sometimes. I, but I think that's, I think that's the case with not even just in your situation, but anytime you feel like you have to prove something, mm. I feel like you're always going to go into it with like, um, a, like just a defensive a, shield, a, a, just a little bit more on, on alert of that, you know? Yeah. Um, and I give you guys freaking props, dude, because there's people that there, there's first of all, there's families that can't do business together, like aunts and uncles and like yeah. sisters. You guys are literally married and like making like doing well and like just being able to do this. It's like it's very impressive. So. I mean, granted, we still have our sheriff tiffs. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Our sheriff tiffs. And but I as mean, all married couples do, you know, and bi- as all married couples and business partners do. Yeah. So. So I think it's like us being able to separate like, oh, this was a business partner disagreement and oh, this is our relationship disagreement Mm -hmm. and learning how to separate the two and making space for the two because literally for the last like four or five years, we have worked together, everyday relationship together, everything 24-7. So yeah, so it's like, knowing how to separate things and even then still gets blurry sometimes and like right now it's just like all work Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's like oh oh my gosh okay we need to uh say good morning to each other Mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. so it's just like yeah learning how to separate the two and realizing when it's like a work um disagreement and when it's like a relationship type thing so it's it's been rough and interesting and um good (laughs) Mm -hmm. being able to learn how to navigate yeah and i mean we still have our issues but for the most part we're in a pretty healthy place for it being business partners by day and now like 18 hour days yeah to some relationship time so it's like We're navigating it. We're figuring it out and um, trying to separate the two when we can because I don't want to like penalize Javier in the relationship part where he doesn't know how to navigate the me being his business partner part yeah you know for sure yeah yeah that makes sense so when it comes to mental health um do you it's not healthy right now (laughs) do you do you (laughs) do you feel like um from from your perspective um do you feel like there's a uh do you feel like it's more acceptable for women to be more open about their mental health I mean, I think it's more of a accepted thing. Yeah. Not 
not that it's normal, but it's like it's generally more accepted because, I mean, me and my sister, like she's staying with me right now and we're talking about our problems all the time. And yeah. like, um, like she's going through a divorce and like her mental state and like um, we talk about like the importance of therapy and like anything that has to do with emotions and like what is healthy what is not healthy like we talk about that stuff all the time but um yeah we're women and we're com comfortable and we are accepting of each other talking about it um so yeah when when men are trying to use their platform like you to talk about like essentially all things mental health um it's it's different and it's not yeah generally viewed as normal i guess mm -hmm. um it's not fair because everybody should be able to talk freely about mental health and if we want to get to healthy places we need to be able to talk about mental health um that's part of my sister's dilemma <laughs> with her current situation um and people or men willing to accept that you need to be able to talk about mental health and deal with your mental health and yeah. like um, any kind of trauma or situation that is not letting you live a healthy life due to mental struggles or like past traumas, etc. Like I don't think men are as willing to accept that and like open to conversations about it or acknowledge that they could potentially have a mental health problem or um, ask for help. Where, where do you think that resistance comes from? Oh, think? definitely just like Is it like tradition? An ego thing? Uh, I mean like tradition um, could be ego. Could be ego. But it's mostly just like naturally ingrained in like societal roles too um like i don't think men have ever been given the space or the permission to be vulnerable and be any less strong in the family mm -hmm. like dynamic I know, I know you can't so speak. So it's a weakness. Yeah. Like, why would you be, able, like, why? Like, yeah. why would you want to talk about that? Because it yeah. shouldn't exist. Yeah. Type deal. Yeah. And do you Was feel like a, a, a man should be worried about um, how maybe a woman will perceive him if he's vulnerable about this or even just shows this type of I like emotion? To, I like to think that women are more like generally accepting of I well I can't think say generally women like me personally mm -hmm. I or the people I associate with and like people that I like to think are like minded as me like dealing with past traumas dealing with like your health dealing with mental health like dealing dealing with all these things that make you who you are is something that you should be actively trying to better slash help yourself with so i would like to think that i want to be supportive to someone that regardless of women men kids like i want to be supportive to people that are like struggling whether it's emotionally financially struggling in general like i want to be supportive and i want to be able to allow someone space to talk about those things and i want to like be there if you do need it i might not always be like the best person to be there for you but i like to think that I'm going to at least allow you the space to be able to experience it and to do it. Mm -hmm. 
So I would hope and I would think that most women are like not going to judge someone and not going to like look at you differently or think anything less of you because like we all experience it. And like if you're honest with yourself and you're looking at someone else with the same kind of compassion that you should look at yourself with, you shouldn't be judging and you shouldn't think that like they're any less of a person. Do you think that two people with differing religious beliefs can uh can work out can make it work when it comes to a relationship oh because you and javi like you you don't have that differing beliefs i feel like when it comes to like when it comes to i feel like religion and politics are not the same thing and i like I feel like you can have differing views and beliefs in both like religion and politics. But then I think there's certain areas that like morally for certain people don't align. Mm -hmm. So if morally certain things don't align, I don't think it can work. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I think like you can have differing opinions under certain things and like maybe different practices in terms of like culture or religion or like have very strong beliefs in certain political things. But if it's like it comes down to like what I think is morally right and someone else thinks is like morally okay, but it's goes against like morally how I feel, I don't think you can survive in terms of a relationship if your morals don't align and ethics and to pe- different people it means different things so yeah i'm gonna lean into morals yeah if morals don't align then i don't know how you can make it work yeah because there can be differing in a bunch of different areas but like morally it has to align mm-hmm yeah. So that's a just, good point. I, I think I, I think you put it in a good way, actually. I think because from my point, I was like, well, if I think you can still love someone and like you can you'd be able to separate if, if you were like accepting of the fact that like they're their own person and I have my own beliefs. You got you might have your own beliefs, but I'm glad that like, for example, if I'm not going to church, I'm glad you're going to church because that's what you feel is right, you know? And so, like, I don't think, like, in that aspect, I feel like it can work. But like you said, there's also just a lot of different things morally that can really just um, conflict with each other. And so I would would probably say the same thing. Um, And so I think we're... I have one more question, and it's somebody... It's something I ask every guest or for the most part every guest um what would you say to someone who's right now um going through a tough time whether it's mentally spiritually physically or really just like in business or really just in general they're they're struggling um what would you say to them that they're not the only person going through something like that. So to not doubt yourself or think any less of yourself because you're facing like certain emotions towards it. Even some of the like toughest people go through some of the shittiest times. So it's like I told my sister this the other day. I was like, there's only so many shitty sticks you can pull before you find one with a flower on the other end (laughs) that's actually pretty good (laughs) Uh, she was having like a super bad day and i was trying to like make her laugh and then i was talking about shitty sticks and pulling shitty sticks and then i'm like you know what sometimes it's so shit and you think it's all just gonna be shit 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 (laughs) but then you pull a pretty flower at the end of your other stick I agree. That's all I got. The <laughs> shitty sticks and the flowers. No, I think there but I think behind uh, that that's an important message of 
just push through yeah man. Thing, just things, push through. things can only be bad for so long and so i don't think suffering is you're gonna encounter suffering right but it's not gonna be forever yeah you know? you're eventually going to get through it and with that that is I pull out my flower stick. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most vulnerable player episode 10 we hit episode 10 that's a uh, that's a good milestone Boom. i think i think uh not well it's a crazy amount of percentage of uh, podcasts that don't make it to episode 10 you so. made it bud Woo! <laughs> thanks for doing this bud <laughs> i'm glad i did i'm glad i did i think it went well thanks doug <laughs> I think we did okay. Yeah, we did. Just cut out the parts where, you know, I just go off tangent. Just talk, cut out the parts where you're just talking, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and circles. Yeah. No, I, I got you. Thanks. I'm a miracle worker. Thanks, bud. Um, but yeah, man, I thank you guys. I like you a little bit more now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, if you haven't already, please hit that like and subscribe button. Um, where can they find you? on the socials um if you want to follow neep collective it's at neep collective or my personal page um joanny <laughs> just just write it out right here so yeah man we'll see you next time yeah man <laughs> 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 okay bye